Hello, my name is Andrew Westover, and I'm the Keith Herring Director of Education and Public Engagement at the New Museum. I join you today from the unceded land of Lenape people, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. On behalf of the New Museum, I am glad to welcome you to today's roundtable conversation with artist Lynn Hirschman Leeson, who will join her collaborators, eminent international scientists Thomas Huber, George Church, and Richard Novak, in a conversation moderated by ethicist Takunda Matos. Programs like this are core to the New Museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. This program is presented in conjunction with the New Museum's current exhibition, Lynn Hirschman Leeson Twisted which is on view at our museum on Bowery. The exhibition is curated by Margot Norton, Alan and Lola Goring curator. I would particularly like to thank education and public engagement staff members, Andrea Calderis and Derek Wright, as well as the entire new museum team for their help bringing this program together. New museum public programs are generously supported by the Research and Residencies Council and digital initiatives are supported by Hermione and David B. Heller. We also thank our members and supporters, like you, who help make these programs possible. A few logistical notes before we begin. This program will last for approximately one hour. If you would like to ask a question, please type, please feel free to use the Q&A function at any time by clicking the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. Please note that this program is being recorded, so your question will be recorded as well. If there is time, our speakers will answer questions during the Q&A at the end of the program. Finally, I encourage you to learn more about upcoming public programs on our website, newmuseum.org. Now, without further ado, I turn the conversation over to our moderator, Takunda Matos. Thank you so much, Andrew, and uh, thank you to all the staff at the New Museum. I'm very excited about our conversation today. Uh, we'll have Thomas Huber, who is an immunologist and a biochemist at Almiral, um, and he will be joined by Richard Novak, who is a bioengineer and entrepreneur, um, and also George Church, who is a geneticist, um, and they're both at the Wyss Institute. And, you know, the star of the show, of course, is Lynn Hirschman Leeson. And I thought a good way for us to sort of get started is to invite Lynn to talk a little bit about both the exhibit and um, kind of segue from that into discussing the collaborations with these scientists and sort of what the genesis for that is. So without further ado, Lynn, please take it away. Sure. Um, well, I, I'm an artist and a filmmaker, and the work that I've done has, has dealt with identity and humans and technology, and really uh, uh, using surveillance and, and discussing media uh, as a tool of empowerment. Um, and I'm really interested in using the tools of our time to talk about the issues of our time. I don't think you could do it any differently. Uh, and how this uh, exhibition really came about was research I did uh, starting in 2007. And at that point, um, I was, uh, I had just finished two films I felt were made a difference for the first one, Strange Culture helped to have an artist released from a 23 year prison sentence. The other was, was Women Art Revolution, which is the only uh, history of the feminist art movement. And I thought, well, what, what is going on in the world that really is important right now? And of course, I realized that um, that it was uh, the, the programming of the genome was going to change everything on the planet. So at that point, I started to, to research this further and eventually um, uh, learned about, uh, about the consequences uh, that would come about that were, was led by George, Ch George Church. And that is what created the Infinity Engine, which you see here uh, as, as you uh, go left in the exhibition. The Infinity Engine was made uh, with CKM uh, uh, sponsoring it at first in 2014. And every time I show it, I add another room. And uh, it's it's got 
uh, a number of rooms, uh, well, eight, because uh, eight is, is the sign of infinity also. And this is, this is room number eight, actually. And you see inside this locked door and a blue light, kind of like Duchamp and, and uh, Eve Klein, a mirror box with two vials inside of it. And if you look close at those two vials, what you'll see on the left is a vial of uh, an antibody that I worked on with Thomas Huber in 2017, we started working. And that happened because I was doing a show in, in Basel and I wanted to uh, work with a, a, a pharmacology company uh, and Novartis was there, and we started to discuss what we could do and eventually came up with the idea of an antibody. And there were actually two antibodies made, one with my name uh, and one with the character who's in the show named Roberta Brightmore, who's a fictional character that lived in the real world. The other side is uh, actually putting all the research I had done, in, including my diaries and um, uh, elements from 10 years of study into a process that was really pioneered by George Church. And it's the idea that you would take everything you've ever done and put it into, um, into something that's a half of an inch tall and invisible. And this kind of became a haiku of what the project uh, uh, essentially became. And George helped me to find Twist Biology, who actually uh, put everything together. And with, with, uh, with Thomas, we made the, uh, the URTA uh, antibody as well as mine. And the and Novartis said that they hit the jackpot with, with Roberta because they'd never been able to find something that wouldn't bind with anything. And, and that's what this antibody did. did. And the, the, the character that I created in the 1970s really was an antibody because it would look for toxins in culture and call attention to them and and uh, try in some way to uh, to cure it, um, which I think is what what uh, artists do. And Thomas and I had a great time working together and we decided to, to go further and began to discuss what we could do as a next project. And uh, we came up with the idea of water purification. And uh, that uh, for that, Thomas found uh, Richard. Uh, and we decided to try to create a project that dealt with, uh, with that as that was something that Richard had already been um, working on. We can move the slides a little bit. Whoever's doing, yeah, this is from, uh, from the Infinity Engine. Um, we can go further. That's wallpaper that are made by that's that's made by CRISPRized um, uh, uh, processes, which is something that George Church actually uh, created, invented, and worked on in his lab. And it's it's the crossing of of uh, uh, of, of genes so that things so that you create completely new identities. And it, it seemed to me that the world was being wallpapered with, with all these uh, different kinds of living forms. And let's go to the next one. Uh, yeah, this is from the antibody. And we can, we can go to the next one. Yeah, this is from the Aquapulse um, uh, system that, uh, uh, we were working on uh, that Richard had already been working on uh, next. And what we finally, uh, can we get to the next slide? Yeah, so we finally came up with this process of, of, L of these water women that were lit by LED uh, lights that would, the lights would filter and uh, as the water and uh, pollutions in the water and, and plastic in the water and to toxicity would evaporate. And this piece was just, was finished, you know, uh, pretty much right before we did the piece. I mean, it seems with, with most of these, these particular works, they couldn't have been done any earlier. I, I could it would have been impossible to do any of these pieces earlier than I did. I did them so they speak in a way to the uh, to the times. And I, I think that this, you know, the, that I'm not unique in working with scientists. I think scientists are really creative and uh, and uh, con and that we should learn to contribute with all disciplines in order to find a way for a sustainable um, planet. 
uh, in the future. To me, it's, it's just a method of, of collaging in different ways. We don't use a foundry, but we use experts, or I use like to find experts in varying fields in which to uh, open up new questions about how we're going to involve evolve and continue to live on, on this uh, planet. So I would also like to hear what other people are, are doing, what the other panelists are doing uh, right now. And, and one question that I did have uh, is not only what works are, people are doing, but since all the panelists work um, in labs, uh, I'm wondering what the feeling is about people who work in unregulated biohacking labs, uh, doing experimentations uh, in gene editing and other things uh, that, that go unchecked officially, but may open up new ways of thinking about these fields, this field. So I think that's a very uh, great, uh, first of all, thank you, Lynn. Uh, wonderful introduction to your project and also to the collaborations. Um, so, yeah, so why don't we maybe, um, since uh, George, I saw your camera turn on first, um, maybe if you can sort of uh, respond a little bit to Lynn's question here and, and talk about your own motivations in terms of collaborating with Lynn um, and then also then transition to talking a little bit about the projects you're working on currently. Right. I think I think it is ironic that that uh, for the twisted uh, exhibit we use twist uh, DNA, which is uh, from a company twist. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> since since uh, Lynn and I started this, uh, my lab has has taken this in a new direction where it what Lynn did was encoded her own work in a binary format, uh, essentially, uh, converting it to DNA. So everything, you know, this, this whole meeting we're having is zeros and ones. And she, and she took that sort of thing and made it into DNA. But what we've done since then is taken non-digital information and, and figured out a way to get a mouse to record its own life. Uh, essentially, every cell in its body is recording its particular journey um, within its cell using about a billionth of its mass to do that record. So it's a fairly small tax to pay for recording key moments of, or, or of, of the life of every cell. And then another group has used our method to, to, in addition to that, keep track of things like oxygen, hypoxia. But, um, and in principle, this could be keep, continue to many other things where you essentially have a diary built into every cell in your body. It's, uh, so I think that's a, it's an amusing direction that it can go where it never passes through a camera or through a computer at all. It stays entirely in the DNA digital realm rather than the computer digital realm. I also like Lynn's, uh, invitation to biohackers. I work, I've work. i worked with biohackers ever since the beginning of the movement. Uh, and uh, maybe we can talk about that a little later on. Yeah, so let me ask a quick follow-up, George, because um, that sounds very fascinating. What, what are some of the reasons for doing this kind of work, right? So for example, with this mouse, why why are you trying to get it to record its life and what are kind of other utilities for some of that? Yeah. Well, every, almost everything we do is a combination of basic science, um, you know, kind of pure science, some sort of applied, uh, something that's applicable to human uh, condition um, and something that's technological. So for the, that mouse, the idea is to, uh, both uh, learn about developmental biology. We're trying to decode how you get the amazing bodies that we have from a simple single cell fertilized egg. But it also might, might lead the way to a way of doing the equivalent of a flight recorder uh, where, you, where, where there's a, a black box that records all kinds of things about the airplane. And then if something bad happens, you can ask specifically what went wrong. And so this would be another way of kind of recording every cell in the body, telling it 
its own story uh, should anything go wrong. Um, so it could be used in a clinical setting. It definitely is already being used in a research setting for uh, making discoveries about developmental biology. Thank you. Um, and so both Thomas and Richard, I think you approach a lot of these collaborations in a slightly different way, but I think there isn't a similar kind of element in thinking about the utility of this. So maybe Thomas, you can speak to that. Yeah. So. So you know, as an immunologist, I'm I'm amazed amazed about our body and the ability of our body to protect us from uh, pathogens, from pathogens which we've never seen before. So this is uh, to a key aspect uh, of of this life saving uh, feature is actually uh, the natural evolution of antibodies in our body. And early in my research, I, I was very much interested and driven by mimicking this process also in a test tube that we can identify maybe uh, antibodies that can help patients suffering from diseases, patients that cannot generate uh, an adequate antibody response to protect themselves or antibodies uh, to re maybe re-equalize uh, dysregulated pathways, which are uh, disease driving. And this was also a common interest uh, in this antibody, which actually then led uh, uh, to this connection with, with Lynn. And, and, uh, and I've learned a very different perspective of, of antibodies, uh, uh, how she saw it. And uh, I think that we, we really intersected here with, uh, with the science and, and, and uh, more the uh, uh, artistic and uh, philosophical aspect of this antibody. But for me, this was one of the key drivers was to try to to um, uh, potentiate a natural process to actually uh, take advantage to uh, to help patients and and uh, to develop actually biotherapeutics uh, around that so that that's also still a, a key part of my work and uh, I think a little bit following this uh, this process of uh, evolution uh, you know when we brainstormed around how we can purify water and we came with, uh, along with this uh, microbiome and the microbiome to me also is kind of a let's say a, a organisms a system of organism uh, the, so to say which really can adapt to to environmental changes now uh, the pollution and the, there were some uh, some findings and some literature around how uh, plastic impacted this microbiome and uh, may ash actually also impacts on our health and our gut microbiome and this is where we actually really wanted to explore this a little bit in a in a broader context. Uh, um, but the basics uh, for, for me, which amazes me, is, is just this ability to evolve and uh, working together with, with with Richard and the Wyss Institute. This was so amazing, you know, that we could then kind of try to have a, a bioreactor within an exhibition, which is actually mimicking kind of this, this evolution while uh, you can actually visit uh, how it actually results in a, in a positive uh, impact. So this is more exploratory. This is maybe not directly linked to, uh, to my core interest in, uh, in uh, exploring um, uh, biotherapeutics, but uh, I think this, this was really uh, an amazing opportunity to, to go a little bit beyond. And just to, to chime in there, and I, I couldn't agree more. It's been just wonderful working with, with Lynn and with Thomas. And I would actually say Lynn is sort of the quintessential original network scientist or systems biologist uh, who's opened my, my mind to uh, the networks outside of science. <laughs> so it's not just science, but it's also science and art and, and the implications of that, uh, of technology in the real world. And I mean, what I was struck by when we started collaborating, I don't know how long ago it was now, uh, with, with the pandemic kind of shifting our time scale a little bit. Um, but what I was amazed by was really how, you know, there's this twist uh, between the, the pros and cons of technology and even from you know, the, you know, Emerson's day warning us against the perils of technology as well as the, the uh, looking at the benefits and we sort of taking that to its um, most up-to-date version or as Lynn says you couldn't you could have done some of these these uh, exhibits before um, some of these technologies came to life and what I loved about this is we're already working on a clean water purification system you know, using microfluidics um, and that's how uh, Thomas and, and Lynn reached out. But then what came out of this collaboration very quickly was, well, what about the, the kind of counterpoint to that, which is, okay, we, we're using a plastic system to, to kill bacteria. 
what happens to that plastic or not just from those systems, but from other people's plastic waste. And then that's where the evolution concept came in where we're evolving bacteria to degrade plastics. And, and you know, I think what really hit home personally was it's not just the art exhibit. So not only are we evolving bacteria right now in the exhibit, I mean, there are actually bacteria that we've selected from waxworm guts of all places. They're in there, they're in, they're in the exhibit right now in the new museum. Um, but that whole, the whole concept spawned a whole new project at the Wies Institute. Um, and we're actually using this whole idea. Yes, we're still working on the, the bacterial killing aspects. That's for one aspect. But then the counterpoint to that is, well, let's use bacteria to actually solve the human waste problem <laughs> and of all this plastic. And, and that's just set off a whole new uh, direction of inquiry. So thank you, Lynn. <laughs> thank you. So Richard, uh, you bring up a very interesting aspect of this and it touches on something that Lynn said earlier. So I wanna kind of get us to come back to this question of that intersection between art and science, right? Cause Lynn said that, you know, there, there are lots of artists who've worked with scientists and Richard, you're talking about, you know, being invited to work on this project and how that's led to, you know, new kinds of research questions, right? New sorts of research programs. But can you all, you know, I'll sort of maybe go back to Lynn, we'll talk a little bit more about that particular aspect of it, right? Why, why the engagement for you, Lynn, with the scientists? And what do you think artists get from that kind of collaboration. Um, and then also for our scientists, right? You've talked a lot about your science, but you know, thinking a little bit more about the artistic component. Um, so again, Lynn, we'll come back to you if you can. Well, I, I really um, don't believe in the boundaries of discipline. Um, obviously, you know, they think that the edges are porous. And when you open the edges, you get a, a, a fresh rebreeding and reinterpretation of possibilities. And uh, ever since Leonardo, who kind of was the consummate uh, artist scientist, uh, many people have worked with, with uh, again, what I call the tools of their time, which is looking at, at innovations and inventions uh, in, in things outside of traditional systems that had been regulated as you know only things that you you made art with you just have to broaden the perspective i mean bell labs i think in the 60s did did uh collaborations with uh, john cage and steve paxton and yvonne rayner and a number of other rauschenberg a number of art, other people who saw that there's the potential that was being unused and i think that if we all work together because you know there's so many creative experts and innovative thinkers that we can expand potential for, for all fields of, of the possibilities of learning more and being able to uh, create new pathways towards understanding and solving the issues that we're living, living through. If that makes any sense. <laughs> I, I, I think it does. Um, but and I like this idea of sort of uh, dissolving some of the distinctions we have. Um, between the various disciplines and areas. Um, but it, it, it makes me think of something that, you know, so like Richard, in, in your bio, you described yourself as an entrepreneur. Would any of you, right, George, Thomas, or Richard, would you describe yourselves as more than just scientists? Would you describe yourselves maybe talking to kind of piggyback a little bit on what Lynn is saying. Are there artistic elements to your pursuit of science? And then what do you think the role of art is in your own scientific um, endeavors? I feel like uh, I'm discovering uh, art, art in, in, in many aspects of, of the science. Um, I think uh, also historically, uh, these disciplines were bridged, they were connected, they were not, not, not completely uh, separate. And uh, what, I, what, what I appreciated also with Linda, you know, what, what I saw like it's maybe, it was a bit of difference to, uh, to be exposed to, a, let's say, um, or, or to step outside the, the, the everyday work as a scientist is that as a scientist, we are, um, or let's say, mainly driven by 
a hypothesis where we have something in mind where we want to to explore or prove but somehow uh, in in the processes uh, we have already a little bit an idea of where we want to go to where 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 our experiments want to lead and with the with the work with Lynn, you know, when when uh, when you showed up in uh, in in 2017, no artists, you know, uh, it was so open. It was so open, you know. We had we had no idea what what actually we want to do or where we want to go to. And and I think this this element, uh, I really appreciated. That was a uh, for me a, a kind of a great learning where I thought like you know that's maybe uh, more an artistic approach where you just want to be very, very open to, to explore and, and, and I'm trying to uh, take that into the, the science uh, environment that, I, that I'm exposed. I want to jump in here and say that I come from a family of, of scientists. In fact, I had a biology, uh, a co-biology minor yeah. major when I was in college. But, but uh, when, when we were little kids, we used to do science uh, science, we used to do magic shows in, in the hallway and you would take two things and it would turn into something else. And there was no boundary as to what you could use. If you want to use a pencil, if you want to use different food colorings and make the changes. And so to me, science and art were always magic and always work together. Very good. Uh, Richard, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about that role of art for you as well? Because I, again, I, I pointed you out because you described yourself as an entrepreneur. And I think there's an aspect of kind of at least artistic ambition that's involved in that. Yeah, I mean, the reason I consider myself an entrepreneur, whether it's starting a for-profit company or a nonprofit, and I've done both, um, it's really to just see the fruits of the kind of the innovation that you get in science and actually make it practical, make it useful in some way, have an impact. Um, and it doesn't have to be always in the form of a product that you sell, but but that process I would consider to be entrepreneurship is to get it outside of a lab or outside of the, the origin of an idea or of a product or a concept. Um, but the, I think the role of art, I think is is absolutely critical. And I, I, I'm 100% with Lynn. I don't see a much of a distinction between disciplines. Um, I know many scientists who are fantastic photographers and painters and sculptors in, in that's you know, the traditional artist sense. Um, and then there are people who wouldn't consider themselves artists, but just the way they put together um, their slide presentations or, or um, you know, even just like color schemes in, in their figures in a publication. You know, there, there's an element of, of art artistry there that gets people to read something uh, more and, and maybe absorb better the, the deep scientific content. And I think there isn't there's sort of a gradient of like where you spend most of your time and what you get paid to do. Uh, but I don't think it makes you one uh, you know scientist or another. I think I just liked what uh, Thomas mentioned that you know kind of the creativity um, you're building as an artist. And I, I'm just thinking, well, isn't that kind of where the word creative comes from? Uh, that you know artists are creating from nothing. Scientists are understanding what already exists to some extent and obviously that's not a you know dichotomy there's a gradient between the two but i was i was laughing internally that there might be something there <laughs> to, to the word creative well yeah so that that's really interesting too because for example one of our panelists here george has been involved in, in a very in very creative projects right um it, and so maybe george can you talk a little bit about your own involvement, not only with synthetic biology, right? Um, but, but for example, I, I just was reading this morning about your involvement with col colosis, right? Um, and this new kind of engagement, which is scientific, but it, it seems to me that it certainly involves creation. Um, it's creative in a sense of uh, a word and really involves imagination. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, uh, so I, I think throughout my life, I've, uh, in, I've been looking for ways that I can use science to help art and, and art to help science. So for example, when I was uh, a kid, my, my mother uh, got a, a payment for for her services in the form of orchids we got two greenhouses full of orchids and so i learned the the, the science and art of of orchids and i would graft uh different different branches of trees together not just trim them but but actually graft them 
And I felt that this was a fusion of art and science. As a, as a photographer, when I was uh, in 10th grade, I was constantly looking for ways that I could manipulate photographs to create the fantasy world that Jerry Ulsman and, and other uh, photographers were starting to do with, with, with classic darkroom. But I wanted to do it by scanning in photographs. It took me years to find out how to scan in photographs. Now we take it just totally for granted. I mean, you can you can do this sort of thing at, at video speeds. Um, but back then it would take hours just to scan one black and white photograph. Um, and then fast forward to the question you asked about the, the mammoths uh, or the cold tolerant elephants. I think a lot of what we do, especially when we interact with um, uh, citizen science and, uh, you know, one of my favorite artists uh, who works very and lives in my lab to some extent, Joe Davis, uh, does communication with extraterrestrials um, in a very serious, very hard science way, thinking deeply about rotating black holes as a part of that communication <clears throat> to the past. Anyway, with the mammoths, uh, it, it, it definitely inspires uh, kids, uh, maybe even more than, than my generation was inspired by uh, the Apollo program, which I think was a kind of an art form. It, was, it wasn't an immediate payoff um, to standing on the moon. There was certainly a strategic military and, and economic uh, advantage to having satellites, uh, GPS, um, weather and uh, communications. But, but the real stunt was going was standing on the moon and, uh, and having a little flag that looks like it's waving in the wind that doesn't exist. And you know, there, were a lot, there are a lot of interesting artistic moments when we communicate to the public. Um, and I've been involved in a lot of uh, uh, writing, uh, the written art, uh, screen screenplays, which to then turn into 4D, four-dimensional art. So uh, I could go on, but the 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 um, a great deal of, ever since I was a teenager, what I've been doing is computer graphics, which is uh, you know for example, 3D molecules that spin in space. That was a major undertaking in 1973. And now, you know, we have beautiful rendered 3D objects uh, on our cell phones. Uh, so, um, but uh, yeah, the, the mammoth is something that's, that, that's at ecological scale. It's at uh, um, a public engagement scale. It is. Uh, it it represents our hopes and dreams that we can solve the climate crisis before the Arctic melts. Uh, and I think hopes hopes and dreams are the stuff of of uh, art and magic. Thank you. So I I want to come back to this idea of both the hopes and dreams and kind of trying to think about some of the pressing, you know, ethical, really in the fullest kind of philosophical sense of the word, right? And in, in, in thinking about all the collective, right? And what we owe to each other in order to survive. But before we sort of kind of come back to that idea, I wanna spend some time thinking about something you just mentioned, George, right? As you're telling the story about your own kind of development um, and, you know, wh which is the role of technology and the way technology change has changed, right, over time. Um, and it's something, Lynn, that I noticed in your own exhibit, I, especially it's even evident in the electronic diaries, right, where the first versions of that, you're working with certain technologies and then you know, the, the image quality, the angles, and, and then even the content of your conversations change over time. So maybe if you could all talk a little bit about, you know, how, how you see the role of changing technologies, what, what is that role in terms of art, but also certainly in terms of science, right? As George was mentioning, the fact that our science has changed, the fact that our technologies have improved to certain levels, 
allows us to do certain things we weren't able to do 30 years ago? Um, and then what does that point to in terms of what we can do in the future? So maybe Lynn, can you talk a little bit about that, especially because it did inspire your art? Yeah, well, well, uh, well, you look at uh, at, at uh, something that's original, and and you never lose it. You know, you may, it may migrate, or you may invent a different way to tell that story in your time, or it may organically grow. But I think you have to honor the process. And something that I like, I, I use all the all the time is time and time is an element of collage so if you have a project uh, like a film that lasts 42 years or from the time you started uh you incorporate I, I like to not revise things but rather incorporate what things were at the time that they were made so that it becomes obvious how what directions we took and what choices were made not only in the content but in the form which uh which underlines uh uh, what's there? I mean, uh, we we move, you know, in different ways, it, like an amoeba with different different feet. You know, you move forward, and then then there's a lag time uh, between uh, when the rest of it catches up and when culture catches up to things. So uh, it, again, it, it's having respect for history without sacrificing the uh, forge to create something that's more relevant and evident in the time that you're living. Richard or Thomas, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about that, that element of it, right? The change of technology over time and what it allows us to do or, you know, the hopes we can have. I think for me, it's uh, it's it's an amazing uh, um, explosion of technology uh, currently. What we thought like uh, twenty years ago, uh, maybe science fiction. You know, some so, some of the technologies are now really real, and they are also now entering into the clinic, and they they try to uh, 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 provide uh, treatment options to 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 patients. That, that we talk about gene therapy, we benefited now all of the. Our, uh, mRNA uh, vaccines that were developed. If we look into uh, the understanding of, of, of what, uh, what what our diseases are, you know, it's way way you know not so long ago we we're we we're thinking about only phenotypic observation on a on a more macro scale. Now we can actually identify a single cell uh, and, and describe a single cell and single cell population. And I think George, you were mentioning in the mouse, it's it's enormous what we can now try to learn um, about uh, very specific pathways in, in a very, um, let's say, uh, 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 dedicated or, or personalized uh, um, uh, approaches uh, for medicine. So to me, for, to me, it's this amazing, the, on one side, this technology that, that evolves, but on the other side, we need also, and that, that's maybe connected to Lynn's uh, vision on uh, uh, keeping, you know, for example, uh, the things on, on the digital, on, on DNA or whatever, the whole, whole digital initiatives to, to digest or to process this information to, to make, make sense out of it, uh, that maybe we are not, or likely we are not able uh, ourselves, but we need the support from these digital initiatives. To me, it's an enormous uh, technology leap, which... I must say, I know I also only understand and understand a bit of it, what that could actually provide us also in the future. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I totally agree, uh, Thomas. I think what amazes me is how, as we learn more, as we develop these new technologies, you, know, you mentioned single cell uh, analysis, right? Um, you know, it's opened up whole new worlds of understanding of, of uh, how people work and how the world works. And yet what's amazing is how little we still know. And I think the more we learn, the more we learn that we know nothing <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. And, and not only in the context of what you're actually looking at, but I think this is where I think artists in general come in is, is to call attention to, as scientists, we're looking at something and artists are looking at everything else as well. And kind of the implication of what you were working on uh, and how that, uh, you know, it's not just the relationship within the lab or within the scientific field, but also with the world. And, and so, you know, the moment you can do single cell 
uh, single cell genetic analysis, you can do single cell forensics, you can do single cell, um, you know, modifications. And, and again, it, it's not what, there's no judgment to be had there. It's sort of, it could be good or bad, right? It's, it's what you do with it, but it, it opens up these new worlds that we just aren't thinking of because we haven't gotten there yet on the technology side or, or the science and scientific understanding. And when we do, we only learn that there's just so much more out there <laughs> and it's just a never ending prospect, which, you know, is good for our careers, I guess, but, uh, but it's also a little daunting that, you know, there's no end. <laughs> right. So Richard, you bring up a word that I think provides a really good segue here, um, the term modification. So Lynn, one of the central themes of your I'd say if your entire artistic corpus here is the notion of the fragmented body, right? Um, the different ways that, you know, we, our bodies can break down, the way illness can, you know, affect us. And, you know, and, and also as coming out of that is you then get into looking at cyborgs, right? The way maybe technology can sometimes come in to, to uh, fix some of that fragmentation, right? Some of that breaking down of our bodies. Um, and, you know, so maybe if you can talk a little bit more about that role of technology in at least inter, you know, in intersecting with uh, the fragmentation of the body. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about that? You know, I think that we are fragmented uh, as human beings, and and that's that's good because you know we we both reflect and refract the culture that we're in, and and also it's it's like a prism. I think if, if it was complete in one entity, uh, it would be a closed system. So you have to. Uh, uh, so I welcome the idea of movement and and again of time and uh, uh, of sh of shifts. I think you also have to go to the origin of things of cyborgs. I've been thinking about that lately. Um, when were they made? How did they start? Uh, and and really, it goes back to World War II. And how does the origin of something technological affect what it becomes? Does it become in the, something in the DNA of the technology itself? Does it become, uh, be, if something is born out of warfare, does that technology then uh, use the idea of surveillance and assault? Because that's uh, what it was originally made to do. So there are all kinds of imp implications in uh, kind of that idea of uh, of where things come from and and the, and the, the base essence of what it was initially created for and where it can go and how we can mutate and change and do things ever you know how, how can can uh, life itself uh, mutate into a completely different uh, essence well it actually is I mean one one thing that it, in in the infinity engine one room is the crisprized wallpaper and in the other room are all the legal um uh threats towards things that have been uh been uh established so that you you see kind of counteraction to to whatever is invented uh that becomes challenged and you know that's what culture is it's all these different aspects that refract refract in a way like a diamond that makes sense <laughs> Yeah, and, and does anyone else want to speak to that? So, because we, we have a question here from um, the audience about sort of the ethical implications, and I, I like the framing of this question, right? The ethical implications of augmenting or modifying the body using technology, right? Um, and so one, I guess, like one way to kind of reframe that question is, what do you all think will be possible for us in the future, right? We've, and one of the things I like about your work, Lynn, is that it, it was very much forward looking, right? It was anticipating certain things that were coming up in terms of the cyborg. But, you know, what do we think for our experts here in terms of technologies, either genetic or otherwise? that maybe could be involved in this um, modification of the body, trying to fix and address different kinds of um, fragmentation that we might have. 
that that goes into the biohacking question that Turch said he wanted to talk about, and I'd be really interested in what he has to say about that too. Yeah, well, uh, so the place where this gets thorniest is when we influence um, embryos, but most of this I think will not involve embryos, but it doesn't stop it from being uh, requiring thought. Uh, certainly uh, some things we could do could be unsafe. Many of the unsafe things are not regulated by the FDA. Um, but there are many things, and there are many things which where people say, well, it's not medical. I mean, this is a const, a, a, a fairly frequent uh, dismissal or uh, pejorative uh, that is applied to anything that's not medical. It's like, like, like the, like one of the things that's brought up is that uh, you, you might use it for cosmetic purposes. Now, a lot of cosmetics is widely accepted, uh, but some, uh, not nothing involving uh, advanced technology. Ancient technologies are used for cosmetic, but sometimes it's used for reinforcing social divides, racism, and so forth, and that's where it starts to get problematic, uh, where we uh, idealize a particular body type, uh, for example, and, and, uh, and uh, stigmatize alternatives. So I think we need to be cautious as we start to decorate ourselves that, uh, that we think about the, the societal implications of some of those decorations. Um, but some of them will, will be augmentations rather than decorations, where we truly have improved our medical condition, possibly our psychosocial uh, condition, um, you know, we might try to augment ourselves so that we're nicer for, to each other uh, and maybe, maybe a little less warlike. Uh, um, we might, uh, we, we certainly do already augment ourselves. Most technology is aug augmentative. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny that we get these these categories where we'll say, oh, it's only augmentation if it goes you know, through DNA, through the germline and produces something biological. Uh, but, uh, but vaccines, for example, I think are extremely uh, augmenting relative to our ancestors. Our ancestors uh, lived in fear of dozens of pathogens that would either um, maim, uh, disability, cause a lifetime disability or kill them. And we, and, and at least in the wealthy part of the world, this is less of a problem, but even, but some, even for the whole world, it's a major augmentation that no one in the world ever has to worry about smallpox. Um, they don't even have to get a vaccine or a, a new drug. So, uh, the biohacking community or, or, or body hacking community uh, gives us a lot of thought, um, um, but it's not certainly not embraced typically by the, science, the, the mainstream scientific community. And, and can you say a little bit more about why, why it's not well, I, part of it is the dismissal that it's not medical and, and we should be focusing. It, it, it's Everything is treated as a zero-sum game. If we're not spending the money on medicine, medicine you know, we should be spending it on. It, it's kind of the theory that, that you should only work on the, on the most common cause of death. Uh, it, you know, no matter how righteous you get, there's always something more righteous that you could be doing with your time um, rather than bring back the mammoth, we should be helping the Asian elephant. Well, we are helping the Asian elephant, that's the point. Um, but it's easy to be dismissive of something because you think something else is more important. And it's not a zero sum game. We need, we need to do all of these things. We need to float all the boats on the rising tide. Um, okay. uh, they, they also dismiss it because it, it could be uh, hazardous, uh, hazardous to the individual or possibly set a bad example for people are too young to know better. <laughs> right. So, this, oh, sorry. Go no, no, go, go ahead, Richard. Well, as you can say, I was looking at, at the questions and kind of the, the last question there is around, uh, you know, bioengineering being focused on, on uh, humans effectively, right? And humans, it's we're dominating nature, uh, et cetera. And I think my response to that is, I think 
uh, it kind of resonates with what you just said, George, in terms of, you know, if it's not medical, we shouldn't be wasting our time or, you know, something along those lines. Um, I've seen that. And, and certainly it gets more attention in the press also if it's focused on a clinical question that affects individuals versus, uh, you know, some, some uh, environmental concern. Um, it tends to be sort of less. Um, that's not to say people aren't working on it, but I, I think that's a really important question this person asked. Um, you know, how can we make it more, um, you know, use the, this technology and this innovation that we're, we're developing sort of as a way to augment ourselves beyond what nature has given us directly, um, but apply that to, um, uh, apply that to basically, you know, non-clinical, non, non-human questions as well. I think, you know, can we sort of sh share the wealth effectively? And uh, that's, that's more knowledge-based, technology-based. I think it's a really great question. I don't think I have a good answer though. <laughs> Thomas, do you have a, an answer? Because you've, you've been smiling uh -huh. a lot. No, no, because because I, I'm of course, you know, focusing on this more uh, clear uh, uh, application on, on the medical, that that's kind of uh, how how I'm uh, uh, exposed to it. And uh, uh, of course, as, as George Church said, like we, uh, the the technologies I'm exposed to is is aiming to um, let's say modify uh, in in a way that it's not given to to uh, uh, following generations, but I think uh, you know from uh, from what we learn how how complex it is to just block one single cytokine in the body, uh, trying to um, to improve yourself uh, with with much more complex system that you may not, um, you know, you, you may actually not know what, what's really going to happen. Uh, I think this is, this is of course a, uh, a big ask and, and, and I think should, should be backed up with some, uh, some real potential benefit uh, rather than uh, the only exploration. Um, that, that's just about me coming more from the medical part as, as, as said. Uh, Right. So that, that, that's good. I, I think that's very helpful because you're pointing us sort of right into my wheelhouse, right, into the ethical questions. Um, because there, there is this element of, of all the things we're talking about here, you know, whether it's technology, science, and even art, right, where all of these things actually have the potential to be harmful or maybe, you know, to just put it in a slightly weaker sense, there, there may be unintended consequences. So, you know, and, and again, Lynn, one of the things I, I like about your approach to art, I, I think it is very philosophical because it, it's a way of helping us think through sort of possible futures, but also possible you know, negative consequences. So maybe if you can all talk a little bit about you know, maybe what are the ways we can guard against things either going wrong or maybe becoming more responsive when things do go wrong. So maybe Lynn, you can start us off again. Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, we, we can't, we can't uh, be afraid of, uh, we can't be afraid. I think we have ideas of things that, that appear to be um, relevant. Uh, we, we have to go forward and deal with uh, some of the implications once we begin to understand what they are, because otherwise you kind of stunt the growth of uh, the creative growth of what you're and potential of what you're trying to uh, to um, to uh, see or see through or the consequences of them. And it takes time, you know, sometimes uh, culture has, has a way of uh, retarding uh, what they're able to see at the, at the time something's made. And I think you have to be uh, able to understand that. Uh, so I think that there are always risks, but, um, but if you're prepared for the cons for potential consequences that, that they're, um, they're contained and you can see uh, see them as you're making them. But of course, you know, the work I do doesn't really deal directly with the biological consequences um, of, of things, which is uh, why I'm interested in some of the uh, boundaries that the scientists are working in and using. But but things like inventing the IRTA, the IRTA antibody would never happen unless we just took the risk and did it. So. 
Well, Lynn, what I really like is that and is what attracted me to collaborating in the first place was that you actually offer a solution with twisted gravity. It's not just pointing out the problems, but you actually point out one potential way. It's not that it's the only way or the, the right way, but it's a potential way to address, not only point out some of these concerns of plastic and bacterial contaminants, both are real, both are real issues, but use one to solve the other and vice versa, right? And I think you're showing that you know, their solutions are possible. It's actually, to me, it's actually very optimistic. It's not just... Uh, you know, <laughs> fire and brimstone and oh no, it's going to be, it's all terrible. I think as you're saying, it's it's critical to pursue these areas and, and just, you know, push the limits of technology, keeping an eye out on for the potential downsides, because there will be some inherently. Uh, but I think you also offer, uh, or, or beginning to offer me, is kind of next stage of your career here, is offering <laughs> the solutions in addition to the commentary. <laughs> well, I, I think that that optimism breeds a, a different type of content, and I think uh, I think we have to uh, uh, filter in optimism into what our challenges are, and hope. I, I just want to note that unintended consequences are not always negative. Uh, <laughs> increasing, increasingly, they're being they're being made almost synonymous that unintended consequences are negative. But in a way, basic science is an effort to algorithmically enhance your chances of getting a serendipitous unintended consequence. Like, for example, the little mold uh, spore that started the uh, the penicillin revolution, okay. which really started the whole antibiotic revolution. Um, that's what we, but that's not just basic science. It's also the so-called practical arts. When we used to talk about arts and sciences long ago, it was the practical arts that you could, you know, you could uh, carve a barrel, uh, you could uh, build a ship. Uh, it was a very beautiful ship, right? But it, it was, uh, there was a practical component. And one of the things I, find very exciting about working with people like Lynn or Joe Davis is that they, they, they're not focused on what the way things are. They're focused on what they could be. Uh, and and uh, in a way it's more synthetic rather than analytic uh, mindset. And that synthetic mindset is unlimited. In a certain sense, analysis is limited. You know, if you have, you know, a perfect, you know, spherical piece of silicon, uh, that's all it is. It's a solid crystal of silicon and you're done. But if you, but from that, you could make uh, an infinite number of silicon structures, sculptures and objects. And, and, uh, and that's, that, that's what I find very attractive uh, is that intentional intentionality of generating serendipity uh, mm -hmm. through, through unintended consequences, seeing, seeing what happens. Artists ask what, tend to ask ahead of engineers what we can do. They'll ask kind of crazy things that we can do. And then, the in, and then a, and an adjacent engineer who's got an open mind say, oh yeah, that's not so crazy. We could actually do that uh, and do something useful with it. Okay. I think this, this, is, this, is really, this is a really cool example. I think uh, a lot of the Biggest discovery are, are un, 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 done unintentionally or by, by accident, and uh, we see that also uh, in part of the the research that we are doing is that you know we we, we can't rationalize everything. We do a lot of engineering, engineering of uh, proteins, and if you only follow exactly what you expect it to be, um, uh, you may not you may not get there because you know you may be just proven wrong. And I've saw a couple of projects which actually benefited from this unexpected finding. You know, the, there was a, a mistake in, a, in, in, in the way how it was conducted. There was a, a mistake in how the, uh, the primer, uh, the DNA primer was designed and led to a sequence which we didn't intend, but actually led to, at the end, to the products which was superior. So I, I think this, uh, what, what you said, George, is, 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 is really, True and and in, maybe in small pieces, not not like the penicillin or bigger discoveries, but maybe in, in some of the small, uh, let's say successes we have in our projects uh, are actually not not sometimes unintended. Maybe, maybe we are not not so openly speaking about this unintention because it's it's more <laughs> more difficult to to uh, justify. But I think it it is a, it's, it's an element of it. I think you have to cherish your mistakes, and I really don't think 
that mistakes exist because they just lead to something else. I also yeah. learning that that nature really wants to survive and beyond mm. us, it itself, like with the wax worms, will find a way to solve problems that uh, before we can even get to it. No, that that's a, the wax worm, I think is, is for me a very interesting example. You know, it, it, is it e even already a symbiotic uh, um, uh, organism that, you know, with the gut microbiome, you know, kind of first uh, the bigger animal causes some disintegration of the plastic uh, somehow, maybe unintentionally, maybe it just wants to get out of the plastic bag, um, but the microbiome then able to kind of process that. Uh, so, so I think this is, uh, to me, kind of a interesting uh, uh, concept. Well, you well, once said that humans were were invented as hosts to bacteria. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, 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 I think so. I think so. Uh, that maybe that's the meaning of life. You know, we are. <laughs> propagating our microbiome which, which is which is seen you know it's being propagated to our uh future generations uh and how we are set up in our anatomy i think uh there is a, a stability which passes over generations in terms of the microbiome and uh let's see if they, this is the part which evolves fast and uh can adapt like maybe in the wax worm <laughs> Maybe we have already a substantial plastic uh, degrading microbiome in our guts, right, Shirt? What do you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's the amazing thing, right? Is that waxworms, I mean, as their name, they actually eat beeswax and, and you know, they go into a hive and destroy a hive. So they're, they're kind of parasites sometimes. You, know, you can think of them that way. But the fact that they have bacteria that help them survive in their normal environment, but that the bacteria can also deal with something that nature has never seen, which is, you know, polypropylene, PET bottles, those kinds of things that are not, you know, nature has not evolved for those. Um, and yet it can deal with it. And so I think that's, that's what amazes me about nature in general is, you know, it, it's just the, the sheer amount of what we don't know. And yet nature somehow does already. Uh, and, and that's what got me into science in the first place was to try to, you know, understand a little bit more of that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, on the artistic side, and I don't think it's a separate side, again, I think it's sort of a, a gradient of, of perspectives, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of the beauty of that and the, the kind of perspective that that brings, uh, not from like trying to understand how it works, but just the fact that it exists and, all right, this is, this is here. And, and uh, yeah, like what you're just saying, you know, what, what's in our guts and what's in, on our skin and, and what can our, our own cells do that we don't yet know they can do. Um, so I think we're, gonna, we're yeah. in for some... Some and, and we are also uh, only just about to start to understand how our microbiome is involved in our immune system, in our health, in the disease setting. I think that's also uh, something which I feel like it's uh, it's it's being explored, and we try to understand, and and will have a, an impact in fu in the future. So let let me ask a, a you know maybe a kind of final question to get start heading towards wrapping up here because you all sound very very optimistic and I, I think this is wonderful it's good it's encouraging but maybe even if let's say all these technologies are positive in the ways that we're describing and thinking about can you speak a little bit to how we can ensure that our pursuit of these technologies is just for everyone because I, I think that is one of those questions, right? We've talked a little bit about climate change, right? Which we know is going to disproportionately affect sort of the most marginalized of society, the most vulnerable of society. Um, and, and I do like this collaboration you have with the, you know, the plastic eating bacteria, because I think that has the potential and, and Lynn, you, you have, you know, statements about this on your website about trying to create more potable water, right? Which I think is a very justice oriented type of project. But is there a way that you think we can ensure that these technological pursuits, these artistic pursuits do lead to actually just outcomes for, for everyone? I don't think you can control that. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, look look at programs like predictive policing, and you know who's targeted uh, uh, in you know with with that. Uh, what what marginal groups are uh, are set to be arrested before they commit a crime? I don't think you can control that. You can't control the world, you know. But part part of I think our individual um, mandate is to do what we can in a way to mitigate. Uh, those possibilities and find find curative forms of uh, of living. I, I think uh, the the best way I see is to show actually how you can apply this technology in a positive sense. Actually, you you um, prime a bit in, in in this direction. You know, you, you're probably not going to be able to prevent someone from exploring it differently. But as you have the example, and then you can establish. Uh, a benefit out of it for the whole society. Maybe this, this is the way how you not can control it, but maybe you can guide or, or uh, the development and, and the inspiration of people. Yeah, and, and, I, don't, I don't think you, uh, the necessary, the goal is to control it, but to provide options. And if some of those options are highly affordable, that will selectively help uh, the, the poorest uh like you know ideally free if it's free then uh and available and and doesn't require uh additional education to operate there's a lot of ifs uh, then then you can um reach everybody as as with smallpox that's one of the few examples where you really have reached everybody because it doesn't require any education or access to roads or to telecommunications um some things uh, all these exponentials where the price drops exponentially um uh means the trickle down turns into a you know pretty rapid flow down uh to to everyone so for example cell phones that used to be you know the bigger than our head and and uh and many people felt were were so powerful they were put the the, the mind at risk um the guinea pigs were the the wealthy people they were uh, both getting the benefit and the possible risks, but eventually it becomes something that helps the people who don't have the luxury of landlines. Uh, they can pool together resources to get a, 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 a mobile phone uh, for the village, uh, or maybe eventually for each of them. So I, and that gives them access not just to microfinance, but to uh, um, but eventually to the, the internet, uh, um, so which is an educational force um, where they can ask exactly the questions they want to ask. So I think that, that that we need to, if we want to contribute without controlling, we provide these opportunities, chances, ways that, that are particularly biased towards the, under, the normally underserved. I think we need to go actually one step further. It's sort of like how technology, I don't think, is inherently good or bad. It's what you do with it that then, you know, turns it into good or bad. Uh, I think giving opportunities absolutely is is uh, part of it. I think we then need to make an effort to actually make sure that the right opportunities for the right situation, right? So uh, one thing I've seen on my, on the, my wearing my nonprofit hat now is, uh, you know, computer donations to uh, schools. Well, you donate a computer, let's say a laptop to a school that doesn't have power, you know, that laptop might last a couple hours and you're done. And then there's a trash heap of, of laptops contaminating now their water. Um, and so I think it, it's, it's, not, it's not a solution for their problem, right? And I think if we just have to think about it again as a system, as a whole big picture network, uh, you know, with the right technology in the right hands in the right time with the right intention, I think it can be, can be used to solve some very powerful problems. And I think having the right opportunities as, as examples of like, here's the good side of technology, right? Um, like with a lighter, you can you can start a, a fire to feed yourself or you can burn down a house with the same thing. Uh, it's what you do with it. Um, but I think here, you know, getting it to uh, people who need the technology, I think it's be the appropriate technology for the appropriate situation. And I think that takes some effort. I think it's not, it's not gonna solve itself. Um, so I think we need to go, as my personal you know, philosophy here is I think we need to go beyond just offering it. And I think, I mean, we'd go to, to the next step of customizing it um, and then see what happens. That's uh, a wonderful point to sort of, uh, you know, kind of 
wrap up our conversation. Um, but maybe with um, our last couple of minutes here, it, does anyone want to add any final words, any, any final thing you want to communicate to our wonderful audience here before we sort of wrap up? I think uh, my 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 learning and, and my my joy here with uh, with the, all the collaboration with Lun, you know, stay stay open, stay curious, and uh, and and just see what, what where it leads to. So I, I think that was uh, so much uh, also education and so much uh, that I've learned from the different views. And and as as uh, Richard was saying, you know, twisted gravity. Uh, what what are the pluses minuses? How how are how are things that in my normal life, you know, I would not see other sides because I'm, I'm so much imprinted. So that that's what what, what I kind of see, you know, stay open and uh, have these conversations. And I feel uh, really uh, grateful that I've had been able to work with such uh, such great uh, people in order to accomplish these things. And I think that uh, that you just have to keep inventing in your mind what you what you want to explore without knowing what, what the end is going to be, because the end keeps changing. Any other thoughts? I, I think we uh, have an, uh, an opportunity to influence the next generation. Kids, uh, babies are born with a lot of natural curiosity, both artistic and scientific curiosity about how the world works, how they can influence it. And uh, sometimes, the, you know, we, we subtly and, and inadvertently discourage that. So I think uh, that sense of wonderment is something that we should be learning from them rather than telling them uh, sit still in straight rows, uh, you know, all wearing uniforms. Um, there's a lot we can learn from the, the next generation, even when they can't even talk. Richard, any final? I, I have nothing to add you know, other than a, a heartfelt thank you to, to Lynn and the museum for this opportunity. Yes, um, I would like to once again thank all of the panelists. Um, I, I do want to just uh, you know add that I, this has been just such a wonderful conversation, and I hope that we've all taken away a lot, especially in terms of the potential and promise of this intersection between art and technology. Um, but, you know, as some of the comments uh, and the questions that came up in the Q&A are really good at reminding us, we do need to always be kind of conscious of you know, where these technologies can take us into, you know, and I hope in all of your projects, you continue to think about how these different projects affect, you know, again, those marginalized, whether they're racial, ethnic, you know, economically, or even in terms of, um, you know, um, abilities, right, embodiment, um, to make sure that we continue to kind of keep an eye on how those individuals, those groups are being affected. Um, but thank you again to all of the panelists and um...